So I tried really hard to write a script for this video, but everything I wrote came across as fake and paid for, and I don't want it to come across that way. This video is reviewing a product I personally enjoyed, and while I did receive the product for free, I have received no monetary influence on this video. So all opinions given are my own from my personal experiences and thoughts on the product. Howdy. My name is Nonat, and I recently was in touch with Sandy Peterson Games about their soon-to-release Cthulhu supplement for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. This is a supplement that's actually existed for a few years now, and it exists for both Pathfinder 1st Edition and Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, with the 2nd Edition version on the way once they're done with the conversion. We reached out to them and they provided us with a free copy of the 5th edition version, the first book of their custom adventure path, as well as a preview of the Pathfinder 2nd edition rules. They didn't provide us that one, but I found it on Reddit, so we're going to talk about it. I just want to talk about my experiences, my expectations, my concerns, what I really loved about it, and really every aspect of my experience with the Sandy Peterson Cthulhu supplement, and why I think it will work with Pathfinder 2e, but maybe in a different way than people expect. Let's start off with my experiences here. We played through the first act of Have You Found It? This is the first book of a four book adventure and this book, The Jitters, took players from level one to level three. I played through it with my friends Beardbox from Beardbox, Krug from Q Times, and my good friend Nathan. It's an awesome adventure that is very roleplay heavy. The combat is few and far between, especially up to the GM's discretion. There are some encounters that are pretty much optional and are only there if the players themselves want to see more combat. You can pretty much skip over them as a GM, and I like that. In fact, a lot of the encounters in this book are optional. It's all up to the GM how much information they want to give and how much they how well they think the players will respond to those encounters. You know, if there's a random combat encounter and your players just fought something and are not looking forward to more combat, they're very roleplay focused, eh, skip that encounter. Maybe slide the small piece of information it gives you somewhere else that they can find without combat. Now don't get me wrong, there is still combat in this adventure, and unavoidable combat at that. There are tons of situations where the players must fight their way through, so those combat-focused classes and character builds are not going to be useless in this campaign. But it's important to know going into it, especially this first book, it's probably about 70-30 roleplay to combat. And that's because this is a mystery adventure. Honestly, I cannot talk details about this adventure really at all, because I don't want to spoil this for people who will play it. I will say, this is a phenomenal adventure. I can't speak for Acts 2, 3, and 4, but Act 1 was a blast to play. The nervous tension, the lack of trust, the sheer number of NPCs that the players encounter, and the judgment the players need to make on who they can trust, who they don't trust, who they give information to, who they receive information from, it's all constantly thought-provoking and super engaging. The very, very bare minimum synopsis I can give is that in the massive city of Tiara Zan, the players need to help f solve a murder. That's all I can really say without giving something away. Even the premise of the murder is really fun for the GM to explain to the players. If you are going to be a player in the jitters, go in as blind as possible. That sense of mystery, that sense of dread and having no idea what's going on, that is part of the charm of this adventure. That's all I'm going to say about the adventure though, because honestly, I don't want to say too much more. It's fantastic. It's super fun. If you're looking for sort of a murder mystery style adventure with that Lovecraftian eldritch twist thrown in, this is perfect for you. Now the big sell for this product is the supplement itself. It is going to be over 500 pages long and includes new ancestries, versatile heritages, uh, new class feats, new archetypes, new, and stuff for the GMs too. There's monsters, there's rules for running great old ones like Cthulhu themselves as these giant encounters. There's so much in this book, it is a ma it's like the same amount of content as the core rulebook of Pathfinder. And I'm super excited to see the full one. I found, yeah, like a 40-page preview that was released on Reddit. And it looks fantastic. Uh, it shows that 
one of the playable characters and actually, or one of the playable ancestries. And one of my players, Beardbox, actually played this ancestry uh, when we played through the adventure. I don't know if I said we played through the adventure in 5th edition D&D because that was already released. Uh, he played as a Dreamlands cat, which is literally a cat that can go to the Dreamlands, which is sort of a, a ethereal reality between dimensions. And it's so cool. He was literally a cat that could telepathically communicate with the rest of the party, and he was a rogue, and so while his actual damage with his claws was like one damage because he was tiny, uh, he still had sneak attacks, so he would still constantly get enemies flat-footed, and it's a ton of fun. There's so much cool stuff that these creatures can do, and unfortunately we haven't gotten everything released. This sort of just has random pages from the, um, from the Pathfinder 2 conversion. Uh, like, it doesn't give any of the proficiencies. If I had to guess, Dreamlands cats are probably going to be proficient in, like, intelligence and wisdom. Uh, it, uh, sorry, uh, uh, intelligence and dexterity. Maybe wisdom and dexterity. Uh, pro almost definitely a flaw in strength. That would, nothing else would make sense. Uh, but I'm so excited to see, like, the available ancestry feats for this, what they're going to do. Uh, they've, there is a new heritage, the Deep One Hybrid, and it's weird. This one's special, and I have to give props to Sandy Peterson for going outside of PF2's comfort zone. This is something myself and a bunch of other third-party publishers don't typically do, because it's kind of dangerous. You don't want to break the rules, but I'm kind of cool with the way they're breaking it. The Deep One Hybrid Versatile Heritage can be taken at any level. Whenever you gain a level, you can lose your current ancestry's heritage and gain the Deep One Hybrid. You lose your original heritage and gain a 15-foot swim speed right when you take it, and then you get access to Deep One ancestry feats, like Deep One Jaws to give you both uh, a Jaws unarmed attack as well as the ability to breathe underwater, or Deep One Legs, which gives you a 20-foot speed swim speed uh, and the powerful leap skill feat it's just so cool there's so much to this and there, so there's there's lang folk which are sort of humans that live in the dream worlds uh, except they're more like satyrs they've got like furry legs with hooves and tails super cool uh, there's the cho which are basically alchemical aliens they're aliens who have like perfected alchemy so much so that their ancestry feats are actually kind of overpowered if you're a Chocho -cho human, you could take Alchemical Tradition, which gives you both trained in crafting and the Alchemical Crafting skill feat at level 1. Uh, and if you're already an Alchemist, you can take any other skill feat of your choice, which is nuts. Uh, and in addition, when you craft an elixir or poison, the first day you spend reduces the amount you must spend in materials by the same amount each additional day does. So they get to craft things cheaper and they get what is usually a level 2 skill feat right at level 1. That's amazing. They've got tons of different feats for the Cho Cho. I'll leave a link in the description to the, the preview of the Pathfinder 2e so you can check this out yourself. I'm not going to go super in-depth and react to all of these, unless you want me to. I'll do a follow-up video on that if you really want to see it. Uh, but there, I'll leave a link in the description for you to see. Uh, as for player character options, they have added the... This was a skill in the 5e version, Yog Sothothery. This is sort of a knowledge-based skill, similar to Arcana or Occultism, about everything Eldritch, everything Lovecraftian. If you need to know and recall knowledge about some kind of abomination, non-natural, anything from the Dreamlands, you use yog sothothery and it's a very powerful skill. The DCs will be way lower if you use this instead of Occultism. But it comes with drawbacks. The higher your proficiency with yog sothothery the more susceptible you are to dread effects, which is an entirely custom system I'll get into in a minute here. Uh, but if you are trained, you have a minus one penalty to all saving throws against Dread, all the way up to a minus four penalty if you are legendary proficiency in Yogg Sothothery. That is so amazingly interesting, that risk versus reward. It's a powerful skill in the setting, but it comes with that risk of insanity, which makes sense. It's so flavorful. Uh, it does say that Yong Sothothery strains the mind of most creatures unless you are an aberration, celestial, fiend, ooze, or undead. So you might be able to argue with your GM if you are, like, 
an undead once the book of the dead is out uh, or if you're something like a flesh warp maybe you don't take that penalty that'd be fun they actually took a chance and made a class archetype before any other class archetypes have been released this was released back in april before paizocon so paizocon was the first announcement of actual official class archetypes so they're going for it and that is the trap setter rogue this is not a different racket this is an archetype and so i believe you would actually take this at first level, not second level, like it says here in the book, because that's how class archetypes work. You take them at first level, and it uses your second level feet, but it basically makes you a snare crafter ranger, the snare crafter archetype, but specifically for rogue. Uh, you become an expert at crafting right at level one, um, and if you somehow had the snare specialist ranger feet, you could take any other ranger feet, which is weird. I'm guessing there was some misunderstanding of how class feats work here. It doesn't seem super obvious and I honestly don't get the exact point of this over the tr snare crafter archetype but there are other feats they've added specifically for the trap setter rogue like reset snare the remains of a snare you crafted that has since been triggered is within your reach and you can kick your triggered snare back into a functional state so for one action you can reset a snare in the same spot without spending another snare or even taking the time to set it down. That's really, really neat. And especially if you can hold someone on a snare, that means you can trigger, you can trigger the bear trap on their leg while your barbarian has them grabbed and you just kick your snare back into, back into active. And then I'm guessing at the end of that enemy's next turn, the snare just clamps back down, which just sounds super fun. They have a couple more feats, uh, tons more feats actually. There's a lot of support for the trap setter dedication, uh, which is really cool. Uh, there's a new Sorcerer Bloodline, the um, two new Bloodlines actually, the Deep One Bloodline, similar to the Deep One Heritage. Uh, this one is all about athletics and water, um, uh, you know, like the Deep Ones themselves. Um, it uses the Occult Spell List, you get some unique Bloodline spells, which we can't see yet. Those are going to be released in the, in the full release, but there we get Sea Dweller unleash item and then their greater magic is dream of the sea and their blood magic is whenever you cast a spell you gain temporary hit points equal to that spell's level for one round pretty cool but i could go on and on about this leak for pathfinder 2e again if you want to see me react to everything they've released in a future video let me know by leaving a comment down below this supplement is amazing and i have looked extensively into the full version of the fifth edition release which we should be getting everything in that book converted to pathfinder 2e and that means we are going to get all of the new ancestries, like ghouls and others that I can't remember off the top of my head. We're going to get all the new classes. There's new classes, or I should say new class subclasses coming out. One of the new archetypes they released, and I'm not sure how they're going to integrate it into Pathfinder 2e, is the Mystery Warrior. One of my players was actually playing with this fighter subclass. And unfortunately, you know, we only just got to third level, so they didn't really get to use it much. Um but they gain proficiency in a lot of, they're, they're basically a, an Eldritch Investigator fighter. Their third level ability is called Paranormal Investigator. They can cast, detect magic, and identify at will. Uh, and in addition to learning how to use the item they identify, they also learn either the creator's alignment, why it was created, or the species of the creator. It's such a cool thing. They are all, in fact, their, their main gimmick, Deduce Weakness, is going to work super well with Pathfinder 2E's Recall Knowledge System. I'm guessing what they're going to have to do is make this a class archetype, and if they learn, if they wait to release this supplement and learn from Secrets of Magic and how that's handled, I bet they can make this a class archetype for fighter. And I think fighters getting class archetypes would be cool, because while not everyone needs them, I know some people have wished that fighters had predetermined subclasses, them and monks as well, and I think class archetypes would be cool to see. Monk is getting the elementalist class archetype, and monks also didn't have subclasses until Secrets of Magic. So there's still hope for fighters, and I think that would be a cool way to integrate the mystery fighter and their paranormal investigation bonuses. Now the final two things I want to touch on in this video are the new Dread and Insanity systems. They go hand in hand. Dread tends to cause insanity, and insanity is sort of a new way for a player character to A, accrue some really debilitating conditions, and B, die without dying. If a player character goes insane enough, 
they will have to leave the campaign, whether they need to be institutionalized or if they actually get scared to death, they turn on the party, something happens, something snaps in their brain, and they cannot continue their life as an adventurer. Dread has eight stages, from zero, unafraid, which is what everyone starts as, and then going forward, depending on how severe the dread effect is and how bad you failed your save, uh, you can go up to disturbed, spooked, afraid, staggered, panicked, paralyzed, and faint. And each of these gives you a different penalty, a different effect, all the way up to fainting, which knocks you unconscious. And if you fail a constitution save against the dread DC, you die, literally scared to death. You mostly accrue dread through a variety of different means, some creatures' abilities inflict it, sometimes the GM will deem a discovery disturbing enough that everyone needs to make a saving throw. You know, you, you open the closet and find the, the, the noble's body rotting inside, everyone needs to make a dread save, otherwise that just, it affects you on an emotional, visceral level that just sticks with you. Uh, yeah, some supernatural abilities can just inflict dread, you know, they'll have custom spells they can cast on you that just inflict this magical dread onto your mind, which is so cool. And again, if your dread gets high enough, you can go insane, as is a staple in the Lovecraftian horror genre. While dread is temporary and can sort of be circumvented and recovered, insanity is often a permanent debuff, and enough of them, or a bad enough one, can completely cause a character to lose their abilities as an adventurer. You actually roll a random d20 every time your character goes insane. And there's a multitude of ways that can go insane. Some higher level, stronger enemies, if you fail a saving throw, can simply inflict insanity on a character. Or if your dread gets high enough, there, you know, I obviously I don't, haven't played enough to know exactly how it all goes down, but there is a multitude of ways to go insane. Some of the things you can gain as insanities most commonly would be a phobia. You have a 25% chance anytime you go insane to gain a phobia, and then you roll another d20 to determine your phobia. That could be a phobia of animals, crowds, fish, plants, loud noises, anything that your character suddenly has an irrational fear of forever. Other insanities include an obsession, especially an obsession about the thing that drove them insane. You know, maybe if a cult of Cthulhu drove you insane, maybe you'll keep adventuring, but your obsession with with Cthulhu and stopping him and stopping his cult gets to an unhealthy level and that becomes a cool flaw you need to role play around. It could be tons of fun. There's disassociation, there's delusion, there's paranoia and hallucinations. And what is important to note about this is how dangerous this can be, not mechanically, but in a role play setting. This book describes it well. This book does not make light of these. It describes them as incredibly debilitating and severe conditions. And it's important when role-playing to not make these a joke, if that makes sense. This won't hit everyone the same way, but some people I know are very heavily affected by some of these insanities. And while that's a good name to categorize it in a role-playing game, it's still important to respect what people in the real world go through when paralleled to what the game is presenting you. And it's fun, it's interesting, and it's engaging to explore these phenomena within your own role-playing game character just be careful when portraying it, especially if you're playing this system with strangers or people you don't know that well. But overall, the Dread and Insanity system is a ton of fun. It's really interesting, it's really engaging, can cause some really, really sharp, drastic character personality changes in the middle of a campaign, and having something sort of mechanical you can say, okay, you've been afflicted by this, roll me your save, you failed, okay, let's see what happens, and then being able, without having to make it up on the spot, you have something that can say, your character is suffering from this mental trauma. You know, it's, it's, there's rules for it, you roll for it, it's fascinating to me. And this is not going to be for everyone. It even states, I believe, that the Dread and Insanity system is optional. If you are not comfortable playing with insanity effects or dread effects, you do not have to. You can absolutely enjoy the adventure I talked about earlier without this system whatsoever. It is completely optional. If you really want to dive in to the mental warping aspect of Lovecraftian horror, I highly recommend it, but it's completely optional. The last thing I want to touch on, I think I said the last thing last time, but this is the actual last thing, uh, my concerns. I mentioned this at the beginning of the video. 
There are light concerns I have with converting this game, this supplement to Pathfinder 2E. I think there's a ton of promise, but what's important to note is that Pathfinder 2E characters are incredibly strong. The average Pathfinder 2 character uh, is leagues stronger than the common folk. Whereas a level 2 or level 3 5e character is a little bit stronger than the common folk. You know, they're starting to get a name for themselves. They're starting to increase that gap. Whereas, like, if a commoner is here, a level 2 D&D character is, like, here. Whereas a level 2 Pathfinder character is, like, up here. A commoner couldn't touch a level 2 Pathfinder character. And that is... My worry is that it's going to take away some of the terror and dread from these adventures. Part of the fear of Lovecraftian horror is that you play as regular people. That's why in Call of Cthulhu, you play as investigators, but you're still a regular Joe. You don't have superpowers. You're not superheroes, and that's what makes it scary. If you get caught in a corner by a monster, you're dead. You can't cast Fireball or Teleport to get away. Adding this in already in D&D makes it difficult, but D&D 5e is a little less power curvy, whereas in Pathfinder 2e, the players are going to get really strong really fast. So devs, Sandy Peterson Games, you have your work cut out for you. I believe you can do it, and I believe there's a really, really cool way you can turn this, but I do think if you play this game, and especially the adventure, have you found it in Pathfinder 2e, it's going to be a little less scary. It's still going to be fun, and the combat's going to be super dynamic and engaging. You'll just feel a bit more like heroes and a bit less hopeless. And whether that's a good or bad thing is entirely up to you. So let me know what you guys think. What do you think about this supplement? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. If you'd like to see me do a full reaction to the 40 pages that has been released as a sneak preview of the Pathfinder 2 e-conversion, let me know. If you like this video, leave a like, Please subscribe to the channel if you want to see more Pathfinder content or just tabletop content like this. I'll leave a link in the description both to the 5th edition conversion, the 1st edition conversion, uh, as well as the sneak preview Pathfinder 2e conversion of this entire supplement. Uh, it's awesome. You can buy it right now on Sandy Peterson Games. I don't know the price off the top of my head. My editor will definitely put it right there uh, with some fireworks behind it because I want to make his life harder. Uh, but that's it from me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and until next time, no net ones.